view in mixed reality mode. So it looks kind of like augmented reality is going to come to the tablet space shortly. Sorry for the video quirkiness that we've got going tonight. Um, <clears throat> you too? Are you nearby? Me too. <laughs> so uh, I, I think I remember what's el what else is on my slide here. So the mixed reality view is being shown as showing holograms off of a tablet and pointing and mixing it in with the camera off the back of the tablet. So I think we'll start to see the platform not only involve HoloLens, our, our uh, immersive devices, but also the tablets and some of the other space. So it's, it's really cool how the story is starting to roll out. Um, along with that event, Microsoft Build um, announced that there are some new hand controllers coming with the new immersive headsets. So they started to show those off. At the Vision Summit, which was a Unity conference, um, they announced that all of the attendees there would receive one of the Acer immersive HMDs. So I, I was really glad to hear that. Wasn't so excited at Build when we didn't hear the same kind of announcements there. That was kind of unfortunate, but I, who am I to judge? Um, the AWP conference, which I didn't get a chance to go to, but I have started to see some of the live stream uh, videos that they've cached on the YouTube channel, looks absolutely awesome. I, I'm kicking myself that I didn't go to that, that event. Uh, I know some of you folks had a chance to go there. I really encourage everyone that didn't get a chance to go to any of those three events to check out the video streams. There are hundreds of hours of amazing content from all three venues uh, posted either on their YouTube channels or in the case of Build on the Channel 9 uh, stash for all of the Build conference information. So do check that information out. Um, my memory's not as good as I thought. The immersive headsets, we started to, uh, I, I personally had some experience as some of the members did uh, with the um, Acer headset in the Hollow Academy sessions. And it was really great to get some hands on. It is a very light headset. Uh, it performs really well. Um, I was a little disappointed, to be honest, that it doesn't, it, it has um, inside out tracking, but it doesn't bring the camera information in and it does not have the spatial awareness that our HoloLens devices have. So maybe we'll see some other partners start to bring devices to the platform in that space, similar to um, the project uh, alloy concepts and stuff that we've heard about. Uh, but the device for $299 or $399 with the controllers uh, is pretty cool. Um, both the Acer and the HP are now available for pre-order. They're talking about coming to devs this summer. As a matter of fact, the, um, the Vision Summit, they told the attendees there that we would be receiving them in July. So um, where the pre-orders and the conference freebies fit in, I'm not quite sure. But uh, we should expect to see, I'm, I'm hoping that at next month's meeting, um, either myself or somebody in the audience will have their hands on some of these headsets and we'll start to be able to show you uh, up close and personal what they're really like. Uh, if, if you're thinking at all about the immersive side of uh, mixed reality and, and the Windows mixed reality platform, I encourage you to pre-order uh, a headset if you're seriously considering it. I've, got one coming from the Summit, but I've also pre-ordered myself an HP to get some comparative uh, feel on the two devices. So those are, those are out in the wild, as uh, more so since last month. And I mentioned the motion controllers and the view mode. There were a ton of other things that went on. Um, I'm not going to uh, try and replace Twitter or any of those other great feeds that you've got available to you, but I do like to kind of point out a couple of important things here. Cordana, any sign of me too? No, I Do you mind giving her a call? Yes, please. So, without too much further ado, I'm going to ask Lucas to come up here. We're going to try switching the cable out to see if we can get his display to show. I hope that works. I do too. You know, HoloLens is a very visual, visual meat um, device, and able to show that stuff would be great. Mine is. My computer's unplugged. Should I go for it? Uh, plug that in and then I'll plug you in with the data. Now, you'll probably start working, um, yeah. at least in the beginning. My concern is why it died out after having this connection. Is it 
go. Should I hold off until it goes wrong and then call her? Yeah, maybe. I'm just going to get started while this is actually working. <laughs> so my name is Lucas Rizzotto and I am an XR creator, which means that I make stuff for all the rising immersive mediums that involve some type of computer attached to just a moment. Is the clicker? No, it's not. Oh, sorry. No problem. My fault. Is this, is this all right, by the way? No, you turn it on. Now it's working? Well, there it's working. There you go. Thank you. So yes, I'm an XR creator, which means that I create content for immersive media that usually has some type of computer attached to your face, as you're all familiar with. And um, originally, I am from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. I have been in the States not for long, and my background is actually not technology at all. Technology is a very recent thing for me. Before, I worked with video production and music as a songwriter for universal music, event production, cartography. I was a DJ for a while, too. Um, and but you know, um, and not, not unlike many of you, once I saw the Oculus Kickstarter back in 2012, it caught my attention. I didn't think much too, uh, I didn't think too much of it at, a time, um, at the time because technology was not my thing and it just seemed something too distant. But I liked the future that it sold. It was a very interesting future and it's, it's a future that was, it has been sold to us for the past couple of decades, but it was never fully idealized. But as the years progressed, people started to make really cool stuff and it just started to get to me. And the more I thought about immersive media in general, the more I just realized that this is actually the future of computers. This is the next major computing platform. And I had to make the decision between passively watching all, all this stuff happening from back home and actually making a jump for it. So with two weeks of planning, I just impulsively moved to New York City. It was very irresponsible of me. But um, I decided to start to teach myself coding and I got enrolled in a computer science degree which I'm finishing this year. And um, I got to find myself into an internship in a VR studio in LA. And I was super excited about it. I was like, now I get to learn from the people you know, who are building the future. I get to actually learn how they're building all of these cool things. And one of the first things that I learned is that no one knows what they're doing. <laughs> Be it in virtual reality, augmented reality, and X reality, and MR. Um, this is this is a time of the industry where there's no, you know, as you know, there's no design principles. There's no reference of of um, really what is a great experience. And there's there's all these types of experiences that don't even exist yet. And that got me hugely excited, especially being somebody that has some issues with imposter syndrome. You can't be an imposter if everyone's clueless. And there's um. It got me excited about the time of the industry and that really there's, there's no way to be wrong. There's just like, um, right now everything's experimental and it's all about learning. Um, and around that time is actually when I got my first contact with the HoloLens and the experience was Fragments. And I was just, uh, I was just utterly amazed at seeing my um, current environment be completely transformed into this other world and how it changed how I moved around my own space and even small things, just like seeing the little mouse move throughout your floor, just made me rethink all my priorities. And I went from, from a VR mindset to a mixed reality mindset um, almost immediately. So I saved some money for a couple of months. Oh, I spent a couple of months building some VR experiences and a bunch of hackathons. I go to those compulsively. Less so now because it's, it's unhealthy to just like live off Doritos and Red Bull for um, long periods of time <laughs> and eventually I made the also very irresponsible decision of buying a HoloLens myself um, at the end of last year and I was hoping that the pressure of owning a three thousand dollar device would kick in and I would just like decide to make things for it uh, so I'm a very guilt-ridden individual so I try to play that to my advantage and I decided to start experimenting so I went to a place called the stupid hackathon in New York City which is designed for creating useless and stupid projects. And I just made a completely useless game called A Thousand Michael Scotts Using the HoloLens. You're surrounded by a bunch of Michael Scott heads and they're screaming at you. And you can either, either blow them up by using the gaze and the air tap, or you can actually scream at them back. So if you look at each one of these heads and you scream, the HoloLens picks up the, the, the input stream of the microphone and causes an explosion. So not world changing in any way but it was a fun experiment and it just got me thinking about the platform so after that i wanted to make something real and my main focus was not really to to create something world changing my main focus was just to make something that was finished 
So I thought about education, and um, I've been thinking about doing something with chemistry for, for a long while, and I, I decided to create just a holographic periodic table, and this, is, you know, this was built um, over, over two days in my messy room, and it was the first version of what was going to become my lab later, and it was very simple. Um, this is actually when I, when I first learned that the HoloLens has its own way of dealing with things. My intention was to make a, something a little more futuristic looking with like, out, like white outlines and white text, but I learned like just, just with this little experience alone that the HoloLens does not like thin lines, and it, it, that white is actually the, one of the most expensive colors to render. So I like this enough to, um, to the point that I wanted to continue with the project, but these little things that you get to learn on a day-to-day -day basis about the HoloLens, on how it deals with color and how it deals um, and how interactions look and how gaze actually works in practice um, are things that I, I kept learning on a, on a daily basis. So a couple of weeks later, um, this, is, this is the end result of, of the, um, the project. It's basically, it's a holographic periodic table that you can spawn anywhere, um, anywhere. It has a nice little curvature, and um, you can basically look at any of the ele um, elements in the periodic table. You can drag them around your environment. Um, it's um, all of the atom structures are procedurally generated through code, and you can also combine some of these atoms together to make molecules in real time. And one of the reasons why I, I enjoyed making this is that because um, I, I I was never a fan of chemistry in high school, and I don't think it's because um, chemistry is boring, but it's because it's badly taught um, in many ways. Um, this, was, this was my attempt to create something that I had, um, that I struggled with in the past, that felt highly abstract into something more visual and more um, interactive and, and also a little more fun. But, you know, um, I finished the project, I, pushed, I, I put it up on the store, which is like, I, it's, it, was, it was my original goal. I did something all the way. But there's only, a, um, there's only a number of HoloLens devices out there, and I wanted to make sure that the world would see that I'm building these types of experiences, and that, um, and that you know, outlets could pick this up. So I used some of my video production experience from the past to make a release video, and this is something that I would recommend that um, all of you do. This is just a minute long, but, ooh, just a second. Basically introducing Hi, my name is Lucas Risotto yep. and I created MyLab, a mixed reality chemistry app designed to help students learn chemistry. MyLab allows you to bring in an interactive periodic table anywhere in your vicinity. You can spawn atoms, you can drag them around your environment, you can study their structure, and you can also combine them together to make molecules. Mixed reality allows us to redesign education in a way that was never possible before. Education today, for the most part, is passive. My lab lets you see the effects of chemistry in real time. It turns education into more of a sandbox experience. My lab is a so it's basically a small video ad, and um, it's it's it's. It's, it's it's something simple. It's something that I, that I did over a day, but I cannot understate how important this is. Um, this was picked up by by several outlets in several uh, like corners of the world, and it's it's not even because the project is, is that amazing. It's just that um, um, this this sort of timing of releasing with um, basic marketing material ready so that people can see it around the world is extremely important. And it was seen by um, um, at least a couple of hundreds of, of thousands of people. Oh, around the world and it helped me get in contact with some of my first enterprise, um, enterprise clients that I work with today. So oh, one of the things that doesn't show also in, um, with the MyLab app is that my original vision was much bigger than what I actually made. And this is something that um, I'm still learning to grapple with today, but managing complexity and understanding that um, good, and, um, good and finished is better than perfect and not finished. And, um, initially, every single atom was supposed to have a face, and different element types would have different personalities based on their physical properties. And I wanted to create everything from like quest systems, so like sodium could ask you to set up a date with chlorine so they could bond together over dinner. 
um, and, and just create new ways to, to engage students. But I, it was too much even for my skill level at the time and um, I, I just wanted to like, do things in, within a six week development cycle. So learning how to give up ideas and just focusing on, on, on the core of what you're building is an ongoing process and it's also extremely important. And I was surprised by the reception that my lab received and, um, and I got to win the Windows Developer Award a couple of weeks ago, which is a kitten trophy, a ninja, ninja kitten cat. trophy, ninja cat, I'm sorry, ninja cat trophy. <laughs> and that, that was fun. So just another project that I, um, that I did real quick over a hackathon in PinNaps um, that was interesting. We, um, me and a couple of my colleagues, Rogue and Tarek, we decided to connect HoloLenses to Facebook accounts and just not build something for the present, but just try to imagine what conversations would be like five years from now. Um, just, just thinking like if all of us had devices like these on our heads, how would that change how we talk to each other? What kind of information would you like to give out and what kind of information would you like to, um, to, um, to, to hold back? So it was, very sim it, it was a very simple heads up display. Like if you're looking at people from a distance, you can only see their first name and something you have in common. So it analyzes your Facebook profiles and it tries to give you l small little prompts just to get you talking to others, but it doesn't give, give away too much information. And whenever you get close to someone, you get this more um, complex UI, UI, which allows you to do a number of things, like connect to all social media, um, read some information about, about the user. I, I don't think this is what the future is gonna look like, but it's, it, was, it was a nifty little app. Uh, we also had a Tinder-like feature that if two users <laughs> that if two users in the same room like each other from a distance, hard particles literally start to you know fly out of your fa uh, out of your head. So there's no way um, you you won't notice that. And um, I think displaying information in this in this way is actually um, less black mirrorish and more fun. And I think this is the way that um, things should be going forward. Um, one of the main things also that I don't have footage of, but that I loved about this app is that whenever you started to record video as a user, your head would get replaced by a camera. And <laughs> this is something that we, um, we, ought, like, we worry about when it comes to mixed reality and augmented reality in the future is that, you know, how do I know people are filming them? So our solution was just like, oh, just put a huge camera on their heads and it, it works. And when it comes to transparency and you know, this, um, we built the project over the hackathon, but the, the networking code just like burst into flames in the final hours and we failed miserably at the hackathon. But the project, it really gave us the opportunity to start finding answers to design questions that are not even being asked yet. And it got us to think about the future in a way that we couldn't do otherwise. So these, these types of small experimental projects um, projects, I think, give you an insight uh, um, on the future that you can't have in any other way. So it's something that I um, try to do whenever I have time and I always learn something new from them. So after that hackathon, I decided to, to do stuff that's a little more commercial. I, I, I created over a weekend, like this little e-commerce shop that just like, it's, it scans your room and then it brings a physical store um, in your environment based on, on the dimensions of your room. Um, very, very prototypey stuff. It's um, very simple. It kind of worked, but I was extremely, extremely un uninspired by this. Um, mostly because I, I started to feel that if I don't make this, if I don't, don't start to explore you know, mixed reality and e-commerce, there's thousands of people that will. And uh, I just felt that the ideas I was working with um, they were not unique to me and they weren't really a contribution. So I decided to do a stuff that felt a little more weird. I walked up to a couple of friends and I asked them like, wouldn't it be cool if you could play snake in mixed reality? Then they were like, what? And I was like, snake, but you are like, you are in first person, you're the head of the snake and you're moving around your environment, collecting stuff and this tail just grows out the back of your skull and that becomes the obstacle. And they said, that's stupid. I said, yeah. And then I decided to build it just because like, um, even before, before building the first prototype, I would just move around like the rooms I was in like this, just imagining the experience. And the movement felt good enough that I decided to, um, to see what it looked like. 
So I built a very, very rough prototype just to see, um, just to see how, how I would feel about it. And these boxes are li literally, there's like snake food written on them. And I felt good about it, and I decided to build it all the way. So, just a second. Oh yeah, this is what you look like playing this, which is ridiculous. And I like this, and I like that um, that the concept in the game completely changed how you um, how you interacted with your environment. And I like that it made all of the users feel like children. This is um, this is something. You, you always smile when you have to get down on the ground to actually like collect a, a burger, which is, it, which is the things you collect in this case, or when you have to jump one time on a piece of furniture. And it's, it's a silly project, but I feel like I learned a lot from it, um, a lot more than my lab actually. And you know, as, 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 as per usual, um, as soon as the project was ready, I made a release video and I gave it an 80s cyber aesthetic too, <laughs> as well. Uh -huh. Drivers, hey. and an intro. Hi, my name is Lucas Risotto, and I created Cyber Snake, a mixed reality reimagining of the classic 2D game of Snake. So in Cyber Snake, you play in first person as an actual snake, and your mission is to move around your environment and collect these cyber burgers scattered around your surroundings. And as you do so, this tail starts to grow out the back of your skull and follows you around, making the game progressively harder to play. Cybersnake also has some power-ups and gameplay twists of its own. One of them is called the Ice Stream, and after collecting an Ice Stream, you can basically look anywhere in your environment and say the words <coughs> to summon what I call a motivational vortex. And what this vortex does is that it sucks in all of the burgers in the surrounding area and it causes this huge explosion, which not only gives you a nice points boost, but you can also use these explosions strategically to blow up parts of your tail. So that yeah, that was um, that was it, and it was um, as 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 you saw like there there was there's some crazy power ups um, that that also serves as game as gameplay twists, and just like my lab, there's all these features that were just like left left um had to be cut out at one point just because they didn't fit into the hole, but it um, also you know once again I had to practice the um, the the act of managing complexity and understanding that, you know, this is really cool, but it really doesn't fit in this project, or this is really cool, but it just, uh, it changes, it changes the whole thing, that um, I also have to cut a lot of, um, a lot of things and power-ups and, and ideas, like a two-player mode, where it's like two players in, in the same environment with their own tails, which was great, but it was insane. It, it, it didn't really work um, from a game perspective, but it worked as in, um, an experiment as an experiment and uh, because of the ways um, that these projects were marketed um, people started to reach out to me for um, for enterprise jobs and those are mostly um, proof of concept for HoloLens apps in general um, right now I've been doing work with um, like a mainframe company on data visualization with um, a drone company on also data visualization an educational startup on developing um, HoloLens experiences to teach them how to learn math, which is fun and exciting, and also a medical visualization. And what you can see here is that the interests um, are wide, and they're, like they, they come from many, many different industries. And but it's still it's still very new. They don't really know how they fit in this space, but they're willing to explore it. And with every year, I I just I keep. Um, hearing back from more companies and, and from more people. And it's, the interest is rising and there's a lot of cool stuff that needs to be made by people like you. So right now I'm working on a new HoloLens project. Um, I'm also working with virtual reality 
uh, with with the, for the Sun Sundance Fest, um, Sundance, the Sundance Film Festival, and doing some consulting Hololens work for all those those startups that I talked about in the past. Um, so I'm just going to talk about some tips real quick, and they're going to be a, a little bit out of context, but just some um, interesting insights that I learned in the past couple of months when it comes to Hololens development. Context-based user interfaces are great, and what I mean by context-based is stuff like, not this, this, this is just a blank screen. Well, I guess I'm just gonna have to explain it. So, um, I'm just gonna skip this for now, actually. I'm going to come back to it later. But managing complexity, as I, as, as I talked to you about, making sure that you know good and, fin and finished is better than perfect and unfinished. Just making sure that the projects that you're building, um, they, they are small and focused enough so that you can actually finish them all the way and you can create an experience that's concise. Um, I don't think this is a time to build huge platforms. I don't think this is a time to build huge projects. I learn a lot more from four-week experiments than I do in three-month ones. Um, and I, I would encourage everybody in the space to do lots of small projects because you get to learn a lot more about the medium, a lot more about design, like how to design, how to develop, than um, picking up really ambitious things that can last six months. And long projects, um, long projects don't even make sense um, at this point because every six months the entire ecosystem changes and the technology and the opportunities and the partners change. So um, I think keeping things short and keeping things small and managing complexity so you're always working with laser focused projects um, is how you make cool stuff. And some of the stuff that I've been seeing from enterprise, the most useful HoloLens projects, they're the ones that are laser focused in solving one singular problem. Like, um, I don't know if you've seen the, um, the ThyssenKrupp application that they map out stairs in, in, in homes. It's, it's, it's extremely simple. They basically use a piece of cardboard to, um, to map out a set of stairs in, in 3D, and they speed up the entire development process by, you know, by a factor of four. And very simple use, it's, it's ridiculously simple, but it really works. And I think that um, a lot of the projects that I'm seeing right now are really ambitious, but we actually, um, less ambition actually might be better when it comes to finding the things that the HoloLens and these types of devices are really strong, uh, strong for. And you know, creating applications that allow you to do things with mixed reality that leverage the device's strengths, that uses the camera, that uses spatial mapping, that uses um, that uses all the things that make the HoloLens a distinctive device. If if your application is just a bunch of windows that you interact with with the air tap, that's not very different from what you will be doing on a regular computer with a mouse and keyboard. So making sure that you're using um, Usually just, just just asking the questions like, am I using the camera? Am I using the spatial understanding? Am I using um, the spatial audio? It already gives you a sense, um, am I using the shared, the shared experience assets? Um, it, already, it, it already gives you a sense that of like, is, is my application fit for this medium or not? Um, do not look, overlook virtual reality. I know that it's called mixed reality by Microsoft, but I'm just gonna call it VR. There's a lot of stuff that, um, not only VR and AR and MR is, is going to converge into the same type of device, there are a lot of technologies that you have today in virtual reality that we will have in, in a couple of years um, with, with like the next HoloLens, like, um, like hand tracking that I was just showcasing. Um, like deep motion hand tracking. What? He died. So with Lead Motion today, they actually just released a new interaction engine. You can design any type of gesture, um, like using your hands, and you can design user interfaces for the future. Um, and you can, if you want, in virtual reality, you, you can load up a, like a digital living room and just pretend that you live five years in the future and design applications and experiences for that, um, for that using the technologies that we have today. So the HoloLens is lacking on a number of, um, on a number of, of, of for, for a number of reasons, especially when it comes to input, but VR has all of those things, and you have the ability to prototype that kind of stuff in VR and um, be ahead of the game when it comes to thinking about mixed reality. And 
you know, experimenting. Not um, most of the applications I see in this space, they are construction, they're real estate, they are um, they're medical, and that makes sense. People are following the money and they're trying to construct these applications um, around the money. But some of the best decisions and some of the best things that you learn, they come from places that you don't expect. And sometimes building just for the sake of experimenting, it really gives you design insights that you wouldn't be able to get otherwise. So what I try to do with my work and what I try to recommend everyone to do is to follow emotional reactions. Mm. If people feel strongly about whatever you're doing, if you can get them to say wow a couple of times, then you know you're onto something. And it doesn't have to be, um, like the goal doesn't have to be obvious, but just making people laugh, cry, or be, not angry, no, not angry, <laughs> but positive emotions in general uh, means that whatever you're building has, it does something to them. And it's, um, I feel like following emotional reactions as opposed to money per se might take you to places um, where there is money, but it's just, it's just unclear from a distance. Also, uh, we know that mixed reality is going to disrupt a bunch of markets um, within the next couple of years, but it will also create entirely new markets from scratch. And those markets, they are, a lot of them are invisible to us because they are not, um, it's, the industry is going to take directions and it's going to take paths and there are design insights that are non-obvious. So I feel that, that if you experiment and, you, and, and, and if you're constantly following emotional reactions from people whenever you're designing your products, you will inevitably bump into to one of those hidden gems. And, and of course, you know, watch for convergence. Um, it's mixed reality on its own is great, but how it combines with all of the stuff that like computer vision, um, artificial intelligence, 3D printing, using physical objects in your experiences and trying to merge you know, the digital and the physical in interesting ways, blockchain, speech recognition, how it mixes with all that, it's really how, um, how, we're, um, how the future is going to be defined. And the products that, um, at least from, from, uh, from my perspective, that will truly revel um, like give huge paradigm shifts to the industry are products that mix mixed reality with all of these technologies and some others as well. So as far as the future is concerned, this is a great time to be in mixed reality. Like every single major company from Apple to Facebook to Snapchat and Google um, is giving huge validation to, um, to augmented reality in, in, in general. And what they're really building is that is uh, like what Google is building and Facebook and Snapchat is building is the underlying software platforms for the mixed reality future that we're all being promised. And um, everybody has this shared vision of, of the future with glasses and um, with the future where we wear computers instead of just stare at them all day, well, for 12 hours a day in my case. Um, and it's, it's, it's a great time to be in the industry. Um, I'm excited to see what, um, what the HoloLens 3 is gonna look like in 2019. Um, the Magic Leap stuff, it exists. It is, it, it is not fake. But the question of whether they're going to slim it down quick enough um, is, is still, um, I, don't, I don't personally know. Um, and I'm especially excited about the AR kit, and I know this is a Microsoft-focused event, but I think it's worth exploring because um, it's, it's another case of a major company providing huge backing for the developer community as far as AR is concerned. And, um, one of, the, one of the key things about um, Apple is that all they move all of their users through their OSs um, pretty predictably. So it's like um, right now, I think over 90% of the users are using iOS 10. And if you compare that with Android, um, Android is like um, the, the versions of the operating system that Android is using is like it varies wildly. There's the, there's, there are many devices that um, like 40% of devices I think are using OSs that are several years old. So. This means, um, the, the fact that the AR kit is going to be integrated in iOS 11, it means that there's going to be a, a, huge, a huge spike in interest this fall when it comes to augmented reality apps. And um, Apple is creating a standardized um, development platform for AR, which could give us a way not only to um, not only develop stuff for enterprise, which is what I'm having to do now, even though my, my ultimate focus is consumer, but it might allow developers to actually create AR apps for consumers and reach them directly with um, the support of, this, um, of companies like these. And 
I I love Microsoft and I love what they're doing, but I really think that the world need, um, that the space needs more competition. So seeing all this stuff from Google and Snap and Facebook and um, and, and Magic Leap, it excites me, and it um, it's good to know that Microsoft is being actually being put under pressure by all of those upcoming visions of the future. And the, um, there was some really cool stuff at the at AWE as well. Is that AWE? Yep. Okay, correct. Uh, it, it really seems like the mixed reality future we were promised will happen. Um, the, the, there's a company called Ultra Ultra Haptics that's doing actual, you know, um, physical touch with ultrasound. That's in actually incredibly convincing, and I'm excited to see if this is actually go going to be the go-to way in which we feel touch with holograms. Um, Companies like like, like Deep Motion continue to do like, really exciting work with hand tracking, and this is stuff you know. It's it might not seem like it's pertinent to mixed reality right now, but I'm expecting the next Hololens to have full hand tracking, and you can already start playing with ideas and interactions today um, using the Leap Motion SDK. And um, Meta is behind the Hololens in every single way, but they're doing some interesting things as well. They um, they, they showed a demo at the conference in which. Um, th their CEO would grab pictures out of their smartphones and just place around their environment. And I've heard of several people who are also working on similar things um, and trying to merge current technology with, this up um, with these up and coming um, devices. And there's a lot of opportunity here too, you know, not only on, on working on the HoloLens as an isolated platform, but seeing how we can intermingle with technology that already exists and in what ways actually we can leverage the 2.5 billion smartphone devices that we have with these holographic um, platforms of the future. Just some food for thought and some things to think about. I actually kind of rushed through it because I was, I was afraid that this thing would just like shut down on me. <laughs> but I would love to hear some questions from you and to see if we can like start a conversation about um, the things that you like to talk about. So I I'm going to jump in there and say that I've got a second mic here, and so that everybody, both here in the audience and those on the live stream, can hear. Um, since we've got a small crowd, I'll hand around the mic. Hey, uh, great presentation. Uh, so, when you talk about like cutting down like things that you do, so you have like this big idea for this uh, application, this experience. And then as you go through it, uh, you find it's very complex. So how do, you, how do you define when something's finished, when you want to cut some of the, those things? You had this bigger vision, and now you're like, OK, it's too complex. Let's cut it down. So that, that's going to be extremely unsat unsatisfactory as an answer. But it's really when I can't stand working on a project anymore. It's, <laughs> it's this one like, I've been doing this for too long. I just want to put this out there and work on something else. But, um, but it also, you know, it, it comes with, um, the first two weeks developing, you can start to see exactly what kind of complexity you're working with. And you can start to see um, exactly what will be actually possible within your time frame. In my case, it's six, seven weeks, and what isn't. So it's, um, you, you just have to be attentive on, on, on the development and just, just try to learn to be um, realistic as far as you know, timelines and as far as am I able to build this in, in, in a way that, live up, that lives up to my vision. Because even though like, um, I wanted to do a lot of stuff with, like, um, in my lab, I wanted to turn all atoms into characters, um, when I tried to give them faces, they would look incredibly creepy. And I was like, I, can't, I, I can try to do this, but I won't be able to do it well. So I just cut out the, those things entirely, and I just focused on, on my skill set and just focused on doing what I could do in the best way possible. Um, so basically, focuses on focusing on strengths and and trying to turn weaknesses into creative choices. This is something that I did with with CyberSnake. Um, the reason why I picked the '80s cyber aesthetic is because it uses a lot of primitives. It uses a lot of cubes, and and like um, all of the particle effects are based around spheres and cubes. And um, I can't do 3D modeling very well. And I knew that if I try to do anything else. It wouldn't look nearly as good, but because I embraced that aesthetic that's very primitive based and very geometric, um, I turned my weaknesses into a creative decision. And 
then my weaknesses became invisible and the project it seemed like you know it was just it was just the, the only way the project could exist so I kind of went off on, on a tangent there but I hope I answered your question Thanks. other questions Yeah, nice job, Lucas. So, um, so it sounds like you've been experimenting in VR. Like you really like all the technology that's available in like straight up VR. Do you now prefer to work in VR over MR because of all the different toolkits and all the different things that you've been exposed to? It's it's a little more exciting because it's changing a little bit more rapidly. Um, it, it, you have new tools and new and new things you can work with um, almost on. On a, like a bi-weekly basis, like it's pe people are making new tools and new things you can play with um, all the time, and um, Microsoft is doing that too at at their own pace. There's actually um, let me just open this up because it's actually useful. This is actually buried very deeply within the Microsoft, uh, within the HoloLens documentation, but there's something called the MR Design Labs, and it has a ton of tools for building UIs like UI quickly um, with with the HoloLens, and um, they have actually some some very fun prefabs that allow you to organize. Here's a periodic table that looks better than mine. Um, that helps you organize objects like in curvature formats and. They, you know, they give you the, the adjustment tools that you see with holograms um, within the, the HoloLens shell. And there's a lot of really useful things for making UI. I'm just, just pointing that out there because if you don't know about it, it actually might be a useful tool just to making things that look good quickly. <laughs> but coming back to the question, uh, yeah, there's like, um, I still, I still, HoloLens is dear to me, and there are projects that I that, that you can only do with HoloLens that um, that virtual reality could, could never even come close to, um, close to at the current state. But there's more stuff happening in VR just because it's it's a more mature um, it's it's a more mature industry. It's not it's not Microsoft um, blazing the trail alone. In VR, you have competition from like a huge number of startups and all of the major tech companies. So there's more happening. So there's more that you can play with on, on a regular basis. So I'm being surprised by it more often, but I'm still working with HoloLens full time. Actually, um, developing for enterprise is what I've been doing full time for the past for the past six months. So yeah. Well, you guys think of your next question. I'm going to ask a question. You you showed the uh, ultra haptics at AWE. Did you have a chance to? Um, use it and touch it and experiment with it yourself at all? I tried a demo last year. I didn't go to AWE, but I, um, I, heard, I heard that they actually improved their, their product quite a lot and that it was very impressive. So I thought it was worth mentioning just because the issue of touch is actually being addressed by some very smart people. I find that an awesome tech that I've been tracking, but I haven't had a chance to try it yet. Other questions? Um, yeah, you, you mentioned one limitation with the um, like the graphics and doing a white line or something being a limitation. And um, are there any others that kind of jump out, like top two or three things to that would be nice to have that aren't there? Limitation-wise, color is like the Hololens does its own thing. Um, the, the, I had to do multiple different designs of the periodic table with different color schemes, just because like um, yellow and orange, for example, they look practically the same. When it, in, in some shades, even yellow and red. So um, you, when you're thinking about color, you need to design it inside of the HoloLens. Um, if you can use stuff like the color picker that they have in the Holo Toolkit, and they have improved versions in the uh, Mixed Reality Labs on GitHub, that's super helpful, and it, uh, it saves you a lot of time. Um, <coughs> other limitations from Oh yeah, um, I learned with CyberSnake that if you move really quickly with the HoloLens, it doesn't really like that so, so much, especially when you're jumping and when you're ducking and when you're, when you're rolling on the ground. So um, if you're going to design for high speed movement, optimize the hell out of it because you're gonna need it. Um, it's, it's, I, 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 um, I ran into some really, really big lag issues throughout the, throughout the development experience. 
um, and it's not because it's it's not because I was I wasn't meeting my um, my FPS thresholds. I was actually it was actually running at two hundred and forty FPS as, as it should. But the movement, I guess, um, it was so intense that it, it took some extra processing power when it comes to to the mapping and the Hololens lost tracking um, a lot. That I just had to optimize it even more to compensate. And yeah, one of um, So you asked about limitations, right? Yes. When it comes to Hololens. Well, designing for the field of view is a given, but it is it is real and it's a real issue. It's the, the sizes of of the of all of the objects in your experiences, the distance between the user and everything that they're interacting with, all of that changes fundamentally when you take into account the field of view. So, you know, trying to think about um, First of all, how far am I going to be from the holograms in the general experience? Um, how does that fit into the field of view? And designing things to be horizontal more than vertical, mm -hmm. because vertical things in HoloLens, the, it, it, the, the field of view is already narrow, but vertically is even like narrower. In, in, um, if, you, if, if you create things that span you know, um, great heights, you have to do a lot of effort to read the whole thing. But if you design things horizontally in a more rectangular fashion, um, the, periodic table is, is it, was, it was designed exactly like that. Um, and that's the reason why like, there's a menu to the right and uh, the platform for spawning atoms on the left is that everything has this nice rectangular shape that fits well within the field of vision. So field of vision, colors, um, tracking, there's probably more and it's gonna come back to me and then I'm gonna come back to you. Can I, can I follow on that tracking? Was that, did it lose it yes. when you were turning too fast or um, or what was, was it like a 360 degree turn or how would you describe so that? So moving too fast, I think it was something with the with, with the uh, the space like the the plane. I forgot the name of of the actual tracking plane. The stabilization plane. Yes, and also when users did things like this, and they looked at the wall, like at a, at a very small portion of the wall, the Hololens lost sense of where it was. Because you're just like staring at a wall real closely, um, it the Hololens doesn't, doesn't know what it's what it's looking at anymore, and it loses its its sense of positioning within the room. So I had to change some things in the design so that people wouldn't um, like reach out too low or look at the ground too closely, because then the Hololens would just lose tracking and the entire experience would fall apart. Um, those are very unique problems that I don't think you will go through unless you have some sort of like construction enterprise application that for some reason forces the users to do this. But yeah, you were talking, you were doing this, you were, you were talking about air, air tapping in what sense? I'm just saying input is pretty limited. Input is extremely limited, which is why doing voice is, is, is great. Um, you don't have to teach people how to say things. But you have to teach them how to air tap, and teaching the air tap is actually much more challenging than um, than one would ever expect. Um, giving people clickers when you're showcasing experiences, great, great thing. It really speeds up um, speeds up the process, and people can get used to the clicker much faster than they get used to the air tap. Um, Uh, can you give us an example that how you do data visualization for enterprise? So, um, with work that I'm doing with uh, th that I did with CompuWare, they have these huge, like huge um, file hierarchies, um, maps that are in 2D, and they span like the entirety of this room, and they literally have to like to scroll like horizontally through the entire file tree just to visualize and just to look for. A particular piece of file or something that they um, that they're looking for. With the Hololens, we were able to get that huge tree of files, a huge 2D um, hierarchy, and turn it into a 3D tree that casca that cascades or like cascades down from the ceiling, and it moves into different directions of the room, and it's something that you can just like you know walk through um, and 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 collaborate with people. So. It's, um, that's just one of the examples. There were many things that we were doing for visualizing large amounts of files and, um, in, in a really simple way. But I think this, this was actually the most impressive use because all of a sudden we got something that was, extremely com that was extremely complex and hard to read 
and we turn into this nice hierarchy that cascade that cascade cascades down in 3D, and we combined it with voice uh, with voice as well. Um, so people could do like searches on hierarchy in real time, and it would point them exactly like where the file was, and it was a shared experience. So multiple people can just like gather around certain clusters of the hierarchy and discuss them together, um, and, and have access to details and all that kind of stuff. So that's that's just one of the um, one of the one that's just one example, and it's it really shows how you can create things that are that span the entire room as well. Not everything needs to be like a self-contained tiny experience. You can use space and you can use it in an interesting way, especially when you're trying to um, use a, uh, visualize a lot at the same time. Also, input-wise, just coming back to that real quick, don't underestimate gaze because it's extremely powerful. I wanted to talk about it um, when it was talking about context-based UI, but gaze basically implies intention. So if you have an app that's um, that's particularly complex, you can, excuse me, oh wow. And certain actions are only attributed to certain holograms. You can, you can create buttons and you can create, um, you can create UI that, that flows with the user's gaze. So in this example, we have a hologram, like, and when it's not being gazed, it's just like sitting there idle. But whenever you look at it, you get all of the buttons surrounding it. And if you think about UI and this, um, and not this menu that's fixed at a, cer uh, at a certain place, like it is with apps like, um, like, like Galaxy Explorer, for example, but something that flows in and out whenever it's needed, um, you can make things that are, for, that are far more um, intuitive and far more better looking. Um, I had I had gifts and videos of it for um, the, for my enterprise stuff, but I can't show it because of the live stream. So I'm sorry about that. But yeah, questions. Next question. Anyone? Oh, we can just chat too. That that works. Uh, what is interesting is is kind of gonna be like what you mentioned, right? Once you you kind of start mixing. Uh, AR, VR, MR with, you know, everything else is going to be happening, right? Interacting with 3D objects, 3D printers, whatever it is. Uh, when it comes to user-generated content, right? When you're going to have applications where it's not just about the experience that you're creating, but you're going to have a conglomerate of people actually generating content within an environment that is going to be 3D, right? Uh, how do you solve, I know that, for example, Microsoft is working on something called 3D for all, right? How do you start uh, educating users about, you know, user-generated content that is going to be 3D for uh, these type of experiences where they have no experience modeling in 3D? That's hard. That, that's the, um, the, 3D it's hard, and um, Microsoft's putting real efforts in actually trying to make it more accessible um, with, with the tools that they're making, like Paint 3D and, um, and the whole Remix project. And I, I've been seeing a lot of cool stuff happening with um, AI-based 3D modeling. Like, you, 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 you basically tell it what it wanted to model, and it finds a way, um, using deep learning, of creating multiple variations of the same types of objects, and also um, using AI as a way to quickly stylize objects um, on the go, like you give it a piece of painting, and it just finds like finds a way to make that object reminiscent of that piece of painting. Everything is very experimental, but I think um, having these very quick ways for the content to be generated automatically, so it's not static, because right now what we have um, what we have and what Microsoft is doing is that they're creating these huge libraries of 3D objects. And we're hoping that they're going to be that there's going to be enough to get people started, and it will. But there will be a point in which people need to be able to customize things quickly without any effort. And I've been seeing a lot of cool stuff in artificial intelligence with 3D modeling and texturing and coloring that might show a, a strange con convergence there, where you can create 3D content really quickly by almost just asking for it. So. Um, also, you know, at Build, they announced that um, they announced uh, the mixed reality stuff. Like, you can just drag in um, a hologram into a video, for example, and um, 
the way that they are intubating AI is extremely interesting. The soundtrack is like automatically generated. Um, it's the the video is edited by AI automatically. Um, the 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 tracking of the 3D objects that you drag into your videos, you work seamless with the video. That's that's basically because of the HoloLens tracking technology. So I'm interested to see how artificial intelligence is going to be brought into play to allow people to create really crazy and varied stuff quickly. But right now, giving them the op like giving them any option and, and giving them these libraries where they can quickly um, edit mo like edit 3D models with stuff like Paint 3D is already a, a good a good effort and a good starting point. Did I answer your question? No. Okay. Any other questions? You guys smell the pizza, I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate that, Lucas. Can we have a round of applause? <laughs> um, I'm going to switch over to my slide deck briefly so that we can give away some door prizes. Um, By the way, thank you everyone for having me. It's really fun to talk about this kind of stuff. Yeah. And I also want to mention that we have three, at least three HoloLens devices here with Lucas's, uh, a couple of his demos on, including the Snake demo. So yeah. if you guys want to check out some of his work while you're here uh, during our pizza break, uh, we'll have those available and you can check them out. So let me play with the slide deck for one sec. I'm hoping that I'll get this live long enough. So first off, I want to mention that we have a July talk lined up. Um, well, in LA, they had some amazing demos at the Vision Summit um, that you could go around and try out uh, from all the different platforms. There are a few different HoloLens setups. This was a mixed uh, platform demo, and it's uh, based on David Bowie's Heroes and a dance performance. And it was really quite impressive, so I ended up getting engaged, speaking with uh, people at the booth for, for a bit, and one of the developers happened to be from Portland. So uh, he'll be coming next month to speak to our group and share some of uh, what he did on that project. And to give you a sense, they literally did 3D scanning of the dance stage as well as the dancers and brought it into kind of a very intriguing um, mixed reality mode. So uh, I encourage you to come out for that. I, of course, want to always recognize our sponsors because they help us make this happen and make it interesting. So we have Unity, Microsoft backing us up, the HoloLens team. Um, the creative group, we're really uh, appreciative of being fed at our meetings, so that's great. Orange Studios provides this space to us uh, each month. Um, they also usually have cards available to uh, have a free try for an afternoon to use this space either for to get away from the office or to uh, bring your office in here for a short period of time. We have a number of folks, and I don't think Lucas knew that uh, Leap Motion was one of our sponsors, uh, as he gave a plug during his talk, but Leap is also one of our, talk, uh, our sponsors that helps uh, us give away some interesting stuff at the end of each meeting. So with that, no further ado, um, we're going to get into the door prize mode. I did skip one slide, I should probably mention. Um, we do have a members only page that if you're not aware of, I keep pounding each month to let you guys know about it. There are some discounts available from our sponsors that um, are available only to the members if you hit that page. So if you're if you signed on as a member on our site, uh, you can get access to this page. And every, well most, most every significant publisher, there's a book title out there, you can get a pretty decent discount off of it because uh, they provide some pretty aggressive uh, discounts. And O'Reilly, I also mentioned, um, has given us a special discount code, and this one is public, I tweeted it out, uh, to get you a discount on the San Francisco conference if you're interested in artificial reality, which 
more and more is being mentioned as a key component in some of the mixed reality experiences you're going to be building in the future. So if you happen to have access in September to San Francisco and uh, budget to go do so, I encourage you to check out that conference as well. So, door prizes tonight. Lucas will hopefully do me the favor of drawing the first uh, winning number. We're going to start with uh, the ebooks from Manning. And the last four digits of the winning number are on. Nine, uh, 6988. 6988. Excellent. Come on up. So anybody who wins, we have a page up here that I need you to sign uh, your email and other information. This is an ebook prize. Manning provides us uh, each month a couple of ebooks to our members. They we, we, we put up a suggestion of Unity in Action as one of their titles that you'll find of interest. And um, you have the option, if you're a winner, to either get Unity in Action or any uh, of the Manning books out of their catalog. So. They'll give you an ebook e copy of that. Um, I'm going to ask the first winner. Uh, Kong, can you draw? Yeah, no peeking. <laughs> the next four digits? 7002. 7002. 702 going once, going twice. Well, there we go. Good. Thank you. So those are the two e-books, and then we're going to move on to a book from Pearson, which ties in nicely with uh, a few of the questions that were asked tonight. It's 3D User Interfaces, Theory and Practice, second edition. This is hot off the presses and very much targeted towards our industry. So this is a cool book that I got in and I thought, well, I wouldn't mind a copy of this, but unfortunately I can't win it. So we're going to ask. Our last winner. <laughs> and he's going to share with us the last four digits. 7001. 7001? <laughs> <laughs> it, no, no, you. What's that? He lost his ticket, lost his ticket, but I thought you Do you have the ticket? Because, I mean, this was your, one of your questions, right? <laughs> Please check your pocket. Do you have it? He's checking the pocket. Yeah. <laughs> did, 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 well, I'll trust you. If nobody else has the number, then I didn't see too many people walk out. There we go. Please come on up. Sign up your name. It's not fixed. We know that. <laughs> So we'll get you to give your information over there and draw the next number for a winner. And I'm going to hold it high just so there's no... Exactly. I'm sure this is my four digits? 6999. Nine, nine. Oh, 6999. Six, 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 Excellent. Okay, so that one is yours. This one, so that people know, the book from Wiley was Mastering Autodesk uh, Autodesk Maya 2016, so also 3D creation related. Um, and then our next ticket is going to be for Robert Scoble and Shell Israel's book, The Fourth Generation. 6992. 6992. 6992. Excellent. 6992. Yes. 6992. Yep. Excellent. So um, if you guys weren't here for uh, Robert Scoville and Shell, um, not only is their book cool, but they also gave an interesting talk, which we have archived on our YouTube channel. So check it out if you want to see uh, those guys in action. Robert's very active. He's also given an interesting, very different talk at AWE, and he's talking all around the globe right now, obviously pushing his book, but also talking about things going on in the industry. I don't always agree with them, but it's always entertaining to listen to. Then the next book, great, I don't know if you guys caught the tweet, but we had a lot of door prizes tonight, so I tweeted that out earlier. I'm going to ask Maria to pick one more number. And the last four digits? 6998. 6998. 
Excellent. And this one's related to O'Reilly's conference coming up. It's hands-on machine learning. Um, so that was the O'Reilly door prize. And the last book, you guys are going to be very well read. The last book is Develop uh, Microsoft HoloLens Apps Now, another guest speaker that we had in previously. Um, one of the, it was the first book on HoloLens in the market and it's a great intro book. And I'll ask Andrew to draw that number. Thank you. Possible digits. 6994. 6994. Every time we go 699, there's a squeal from this side of the audience. <laughs> <laughs> the last one. 6994. Anybody not check their pocket yet? Somebody doesn't want the book? <laughs> Uh, going once, going twice, going three times, and I'll ask Andrew to pull one more number. 6985. 6985. There we go. Somebody is in the room for that. We'll have them come up and sign that. And that takes us to the grand prize, so to speak, grand door prize. A leap motion controller and cabling kit. Now, obviously it's not going to directly connect to a hull lens, but there are all kinds of creative configurations that you'd be able to connect this to a PC and wirelessly transmit information back and forth to your hull lens. Also, we now have immersive devices coming to this platform shortly, and there's no reason why you couldn't take and tape and glue this or mount this with the kit onto your um, immersive headset and start using that. Just make sure you don't cover up any of the sensors for the inside out tracking. So Leap has been great about giving us devices uh, to hand out each month and they're very, very active in the VR space. So you'll probably see them coming out on um, some OEM devices in the near future. Thank you, Matthew. Four digits. 6994. 6994. Uh, how could we? Oh, well, he's coming up now. 6994, have you got that? I do, but. Well, it wasn't called, so. Yeah. <laughs> or you would have come up, right? Right. <laughs> so come on up. <laughs> <laughs> it might have been close to it. <laughs> so we did have, we had a lot of 69. We had 6998 and 6992 for those keeping track at home. But uh, Ross, thank you. Uh, I'll get you to sign up for that. Um, that's our door prizes for this month. We have a whole bunch of pizza. Um, there are also um, soft drinks and stuff available. You're welcome and free to tap into any of the orange soda. Uh, well, I don't mean orange, orange soda. Studios. The Orange Studios <laughs> soda <laughs> at the back. Uh, and mingle around. We'll also have Holland's demos available for anybody who's interested, either first time or you just want to see one of these apps. Come check us out. Thanks, folks.